I'd like to start off by thanking Web Direction South for inviting me out here. Um, this is such a wonderful group of people that I get to talk with, and I'm really looking forward to seeing all the talks today and meeting all of you. Um, so yes, my name is Rachel Binks. Um, I'm a designer, developer, data visualizer. Um, I currently live in Brooklyn, New York. And before that, I was living in San Francisco, uh, working at Stamen Design, uh, which is a design firm specializing in data visualization and mapping. Um, and I got to work on a lot of cool projects with a lot of cool clients. And uh, since then, I've been working on MeshU. Um, and MeshU sort of takes the places that you've been in the world, uh, plots them on a map, turns them into a shape, and then that shape is either laser cut or 3D printed into jewelry. And what's really exciting is that uh, my partner and I, uh, both of these are done with my partner, Sha Huang, uh, we just launched a new project last night called GIFPOP. Um, and that's a way to take animated GIFs and to uh, print them out with lenticular film, sort of make physical GIFs. So, like many of you, I spend most of my time on the internet. This is a pretty accurate representation of my life right here. Um, and I find myself increasingly spending more time in spaces that are kind of designed for me to be existing in them. And what I mean by that is sort of these social networks that are kind of turning themselves into sort of content portals. Um, and it's made for me to spend a lot of my time there and sort of consume the rest of my internet through them. Um, and since those uh, sort of places have other users and since I have a profile, there's sort of, you know, this social experience um, and I would argue that kind of any website that has uh, these elements of accounts and profiles and people that you can interact with kind of takes on this social network -y vibe. Um, and what's interesting about these kind of social networks is that we're taking um, this history of, you know, face-to-face -face communication, interaction, relationships that we have had hundreds of thousands of years to develop as a species and we are trying to translate it into this technology that we have had around for maybe you know, 25 years of widespread use. Um, and so there's going to be some points where that transition kind of works and when it feels good and sometimes where it doesn't. Sometimes where it's hard to kind of reconcile what we're used to in real life to what we're allowed to do online. Um, and that's what I'd like to talk to you today about um, is some of the sites and some of the practices that uh, work well in this space, and some of them that don't. <laughs> well, it's too shocking to even show you. <laughs> um, so I would be remiss if I didn't start off uh, talking about Facebook, uh, which is, of course, the largest social network ever created. There's more than a billion users. Almost everyone is on there, at least, you know, everyone who has consistent access to the internet. Um, and it's interesting with Facebook because uh, sort of over the course of their development, um, their engineers and product managers have made very specific choices about uh, how we are able to present ourselves online, how we're able to build an identity, and the types of relationships that we are encouraged to have on the site. Um, and Mark Zuckerberg, in an interview for this book, The Facebook Effect, said that the days of you having a different image for different groups in your life, say your childhood friends, your coworkers, your loved ones, are coming to an end. And this is a very bold statement, I would say. Um, and you know, the, the ways that Facebook kind of makes this happen are you know, for you to have this sort of single monolithic identity that is supposed to fit with every group of people in your life and kind of every facet of yourself. Um, and the reason this is kind of so bold is that, you know, obviously this is not how people interact in the real world. Um, and one of the people who has been doing a lot of work on this is an ethnographer uh, named Trisha Wong who titles this The Elastic Self. And that's the tendency for people to have kind of different sides of their personality um, that they express in different contexts. So your identity kind of stretches akin to a rubber band. Also, this is a really amazing GIF. <laughs> and Trisha talks about this sort of along a continuum of the prescribed self to the elastic self. Now, the prescribed self are sort of the things that you're born into in this world. This includes your race, 
your class, your gender. There are all these things that you kind of can't escape, that everyone knows about you if they know you closely in real life. And so the prescribed self is maybe who you kind of present to you know, your family, your coworkers, people who know you very well. Um, the elastic self might be kind of the ways that you can explore different interests of yours and different, maybe even different whole sort of personality styles. Um, it might be how you present yourself differently in a room of strangers, how you might meet someone at Red Web Direction South and be really, you know, open and flirty and totally smart because you know what you're talking about. And you know, maybe that doesn't translate to other parts of your life. Um, and so different social networks kind of pull you in one of these directions on this continuum. Um, Facebook, for example, you know, has a very clear policies about uh, sort of the type of identity that you're supposed to be creating there. There's the real names, uh, which you know, explicitly ties your online and offline self together. There's the fact that they, that they um, suggest that you sort of friend people that you know in real life, that you sort of translate your friendships uh, into this Facebook setting. And so it sort of suggests that you should be only friending people that you know already and sort of uh, carrying those relationships along with you. Um, and then finally, I would argue that even the introduction of uh, the timeline on Facebook um, makes it very easy for people to uh, scroll back quickly in your history. And so it sort of keeps your identity uh, kind of cohesive in this one long narrative. Um, you kind of have to present one self to the people that are your childhood friends and people you just meet on the street. In contrast, something like Twitter or Tumblr allow for more expression because you can set up um, an anonymous account, you can use a pseudonym, and Tumblr specifically has policies like you can um, very easily start different blogs for different interests of yours under the same account. So you can have one for JavaScript, you can have one for GIFs, you can explore all of these different sides of your interests and your personality without having to keep them under a cohesive whole. Um, and you can also change you know, the name of those blogs at any time. You're not really locked into keeping the same uh, interests or expressions um, together. And An Xiao, in writing about this, uh, compared Facebook to kind of the small town that you never left, that it's mired in the past and the present. And but in contrast, she calls Tumblr kind of like a big city where you can go to a different bar every night and try on a new self. Now, most social networks kind of take uh, a middle approach between uh, these two extremes with different ways that you're allowed to express yourself, if there's a fluid or a rigid identity, if it's sort of monolithic or multifaceted. And I just want to bring up one more example in this, which is, I think, really interesting, um, and that would be Snapchat which is a photo sharing service where you can send a photo to people and then that photo will be deleted after however many seconds that you set. Um, and although there was sort of a moral panic about this when it came out, you know, the kids are gonna use it for sexting, I think most users uh, use it to sort of convey just tiny moments of their life and share it with their friends. Um, and there's this interesting feature that they just implemented called uh, Stories. And this came about because when you take a photo, you have to go through and select through your contacts uh, who you're going to send it to. And a lot of users wanted a sort of send all button. Um, and so they made a request to the app creators. Um, but those creators were worried that if they introduced this feature, that it would sort of take away the personal nature of Snapchat. And they wanted to keep it kind of focused on the relationships that you have uh, on a per photo basis. Um, so instead, they implemented this thing called Stories, which is sort of your public profile on Snapchat. Um, and so you can take a snap, set it to public, um, and then it goes into your feed. And the interesting thing about your feed is that it's only uh, each photo stays in it for 24 hours. And so at the end of that, it falls off the other side. And so you always have this kind of up-to-the-moment image of who a person is. And, you know, the users who are setting these, pro these uh, photos as public aren't sort of bound by having to fit in that image into um, a longer history of their identity. And the founder, uh, when talking about this, was 
saying that there's a hard thing that happens when you have a static profile on these sites, that you feel pressure to fit in new content with your online persona that's supposed to be you. Now, to bring it back to Facebook, I think that there's kind of this corollary from having um, this one sort of single persona in that your action should be public. And this kind of makes sense, you know, if you sort of have this platonic form of an identity that kind of fits every single need in your life, then of course everyone in your life should be able to see everything that you do. You know, it's sort of this, I don't know, confidence maybe of having uh, this one-size-fits-all approach to identity. Um, and this leads, this kind of idea leads to something a bit more insidious, uh, sort of this famous quote from Eric Schmidt a couple of years ago, um, you know, if you have something you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place, which is kind of shocking. And I don't want to get too far into this discussion, but I think there's an incredible amount of privilege for someone who can say this. And I think that if you have ever felt attacked, harassed, or threatened because of who you are or what you're doing, you would not be making that statement. Zuckerberg has a sort of similar idea that the age of privacy is over. And to be fair, both of these quotes are from about the 2010 era when there was sort of this revamp of a lot of sites and kind of publishing more public data. Um, Facebook, you know, I almost forgot this, but Facebook for the first six years was a very private network and you had to know people personally. You had to approve their friendship with someone before they could find out information about you. And then at the beginning of 2010, this all kind of changed and Facebook decided that they wanted all of this information public. And so they sort of made everything public by default and from there we've been kind of playing this whack-a-mole game of privacy settings where it's kind of hard to find where things are, it's hard to figure out what exactly you're controlling and there's a huge long list of the different options that you have. Now, I don't want to pick on these two too much, but it's interesting that even Twitter, who uh, you know, so far in this talk has been kind of on the good guy's side of more fluid identity. Um, in light of the Twitter IPO filing, there's been some uh, documents come to light uh, that are sort of describing uh, Twitter's own relationship with privacy. Um, Jack Dorsey was, for one, pushing that all conversations should be public. And in the last redesign, you might remember that direct messages were kind of a bit more hidden and a bit harder to find. And that was actually this plan to eventually phase them out and sort of publicize all of Twitter. Um, and sort of in their quest to IPO now, um, they sort of realized that these new private messaging apps um, have been coming more into vogue, that people um, you know, are starting to use these more. And so there's even talk of there being an entirely separate standalone private messenger app through Twitter. Now, you know, part of these decisions in creating these networks are kind of from a, I don't know, ideological standpoint of what should be public and what should be private, but obviously there's very uh, real business reasons for uh, revealing more information. And you know, some of it's good, some of it's bad, some of it is about creating content that's tailored for you or making it easier to find your friends online. And some of it's more insidious, like selling your data to advertisers or, you know, making it easier for strangers to learn information about you that, you know, maybe you didn't, maybe you're not so sure you want public. Um, but there's this kind of worrying trend that kind of goes along uh, with these other ones of sort of social networks uh, kind of stepping in and taking control over what they think uh, would be a good social graph for you. Um, and kind of, I think, one of the worst defenders on this would have to be Path, who they've gotten better, but, you know, in their original days, they had this really bad habit of, well, they still upload your entire contact list to their servers, um, but they would sort of auto-text all of your contacts, uh, saying that they had, you had photos that you wanted to share. Um, and there's a thing in the UK where I guess if you text a landline, uh, there's a service that calls that phone number and reads it aloud. So some of these people were just getting, you know, pounded with messages saying that their, you know, contact had all these photos to share. And Stefan Kenwright uh, documented this on his blog and has this screenshot from his aunt, which is kind of the sad thing of, you know, hey, I don't have a smartphone, but I'd really like to see them. 
Can you send them along? Um, which at best, you know, is kind of heartbreaking that this app has decided that it's going to kind of insert yourself, it, itself in uh, your private relationships. And at worst, this can be outright dangerous. Um, you probably remember when Google introduced Buzz and it decided to start auto-setting your contacts as close friends uh, set by the people that you email most frequently with. And while this worked, you know, maybe in some general majority sense, there are many, many little outliers that are kind of dangerous that you don't want the people that email you all the time that you are trying to push out of your life having sudden access to the things that you share day to day with those that you hold close. Um, and I think that all of these kind of fall under this term called the user engagement death spiral. Um, and this is a term borrowed from aviation where uh, the pilot um, usually flies you know, with the horizon line, but in a set of clouds, um, it's very easy to start getting tilted and start banking. And the motion of the airplane sort of counteracts your inner ear. And so people that think that they can you know, they can feel when they're going to be tilted anyway, actually can't, and so you feel like you're straight, even though you can start getting into a bank, which eventually, if it keeps going, turns into a spiral and eventually will bring you down. Um, and so there's, you know, this movement at the end of World War II to start end, uh, putting in these instruments in planes, and a lot of these pilots sort of didn't want to trust this, they wanted to trust their instincts. Um, of course, enough crashes happened that this became more of a mandated thing that no people really needed to follow uh, the instruments in their cockpit uh, to you know, save lives. And Wong argues that there's kind of the opposite thing happening today with the instruments that we use uh, to measure the success of our sites. That if we get caught up too much in the analytics, in the numbers, um, that it's very easy to start justifying these tactics, which alienate a lot of your users, uh, because you know there's this momentary increase in signups, uh, there's you know more people looking at your pages, and if you sort of get caught up in those numbers too far, then you sacrifice um, kind of the long-term benefits of treating your users with respect. Um, and I think that all of these kind of come from this idea that sort of the online experiences are maybe second citizens to your offline ones, that uh, they're kind of separate and distinct and that we don't really need to be treating them in the same way. Um, and sociologist Nathan Jurgensen calls this the digital duality. Um, and this idea is kind of encapsulated uh, by this classic New Yorker cartoon that on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. And this is kind of a cute, lightheaded approach to it, but this kind of thinking that these worlds are separate and distinct um, can often kind of lead to this more negative take to the time that we're spending online. Um, and this kind of gets translated into some of these books that are worrying about what the internet is doing to us, what it's doing to our relationships, to our communication, to our intelligence. And Jurgensen collects uh, some of these books that he thinks falls into this category. And I don't know about you, but I've read a couple of these. Um, and you know, like they're pithy, they're interesting, they've got some statistics and kind of a lot of fear mongering. And you know, you sit there thinking like, oh, what if I am throwing my life away being online? I, I, I really actually just wanna highlight this one because I think it's kind of amazing. Jeopardizing our future. Oh. <laughs> And you know, this is the same reason that our news headlines are almost uniformly negative and they're fearful. And you know, it grabs your attention and makes you want to learn more, but it's not actually kind of reflecting reality. Um, and Jurgensen sort of summarizes this that we're trading the rich physical and real nature of face-to-face -face communication for the digital, virtual, and trivial of the online world. Um, and hopefully, especially this audience, given how much time we spend online and we spend you know, building things for the online world, uh, wouldn't find this to be true. Jurgensen offers another uh, sort of view of this, which is, he terms it augmented reality, and that's 
uh, kind of the view that our online and offline relationships uh, influence each other, play upon each other, and you know, ultimately build upon each other. And you, know, you can think about this as your offline friendships get translated onto Facebook, but your interactions on Facebook, of course, in, uh, influence uh, your real line friendships, or <laughs> real line offline friendships. Um, and you know, the sort of the communication that you have online um, ultimately is improved and is better because of these wonderful tools that we have in technology. It's a lot harder to sell the kind of positivist, you know, future-facing view of the internet, and a lot easier to sort of scare people into reading your book. So, who remembers these? Or at least when they were a big deal. Maybe 20 years ago, when everyone started having computers and email was a thing, and we started saying, oh, wow, look at all these different ways you can make faces with punctuation. And there were all these email lists sending around, like, ah, oh, here's all the faces that I came up with, and now we can communicate our feelings online. Which was sort of silly, and, you know, you could argue maybe unnecessary, and there were tons of decorum arguments about, like, is this cheesy to add a little smiley face? You know, should we do it, should we not? Um, but I think what's interesting is that this is sort of an approach to taking uh, kind of the ways that we interact uh, you know, emotionally in our communication and trying to put that into text a little bit. And of course now we have emoji, we have a couple more faces to choose from, we can decide exactly how much of a smile we want to send, how much of a tongue we want to stick out. And I would argue that kind of the conclusion of this would be in reaction GIFs, which are kind of the expression de jour. And, you know, we've got excited, we've got super sad, we've got super frustrated. And, you know, there's entire kind of corners of the internet that are dedicated to taking these tiny GIFs of, you know, online uh, video emotions in a tight little loop. Uh, the reaction GIF subreddit is really good. I check it every day. Um, and it's interesting, you know, in a site like Tumblr, because people are starting to use this in the middle of these sort of longer text posts, where, you know, instead of saying, I'm so excited and trying to explain in a bunch of words how you're excited, and instead of having to choose the right emoticon or emoji, people get to now choose the right reaction GIF and tell you exactly what kind of excited they are. Um, and I think that this is important, not because GIFs are amazing and we should have GIFs everywhere, but because I think that in sort of face-to-face -face communication, there's a lot that is dependent on you know, your facial expression, your body language. There's a lot of movement that gets lost when you translate it only to text. And I think that reaction GIFs are kind of a step forward in kind of bringing back some of that movement and some of that energy. Um, and in general, you know, we're kind of building these different ways that we communicate um, online, and I think we're kind of leading towards, you know, this augmented reality of communication where uh, all the benefits of having our friends online and kind of accessible and uh, at our fingertips, we're kind of now much more able to uh, be communicating uh, more clearly with them exactly what we want to say. And if we take this in towards a personal direction, we, I think, wind up at the selfie, which is kind of this new thing that everyone hates and loves and loves to hate. And, you know, God, there's so much hate for selfies right now, which is kind of amazing because, you know, every time they get posted, people also respond to them the most, which is sort of this perpetuating cycle, you know? Um, and it's interesting that uh, the creators of Vine, when they introduced their app, originally the front-facing camera, uh, you couldn't use that. And that was partially a technical decision and partially because one of the co-founders didn't want selfies. He thought it would denigrate the quality that pe of content that people were producing on his app. And thankfully, there were a bunch of users that wrote in and said, hey, I'd really like to be able to you know, pose myself. And his other co-founders kind of argued with him enough that he finally gave in, and so they built in feature support. And he says, you know, after thinking about this more and after considering kind of the impact of that on Vine, 
that it wasn't about vanity at all, that it wasn't really about how you look or posing, but it was more about kind of this diary experience that you're sharing with people. And it was a more personal way um, to be sharing kind of the things that you would send to your friends through Vine. And in general, I think it's important to remember that humans are hardwired to respond to faces. I mean, if you think of early childhood development, face recognition and motion are much earlier than language. And if you want people to kind of respond the most to what you're saying, of course it makes sense that you would include a picture of your face. And finally, I think there's this other kind of hand-wringing, tiny moral panic about uh, this nature of feeds and that we're kind of turning all of our content into this bite-sized, easily digestible, tiny little meaningless content. Um, and while it's certainly true that, you know, you can post smaller and smaller bits of content that, uh, you know, there, there is some uh, real information about how our attention span is getting shorter, but if you think about this, um, the kind of content that you're creating in a long form post and a shorter one are usually for different audiences. And, you know, if you think back to when you were a kid and had a pen pal, you would of course write long letters because you didn't get to see that person that often. You didn't have that context of your day-to-day -day interaction. And you had to fill out more about, you know, kind of what you were thinking and where you were in life. And I think that, you know, a lot of the long form posts, which aren't dead on the internet, they're still there, they're still being written. Um, and it's usually for more of a public audience or for someone that you don't see very often, your friends in another country that you write really long emails to. And these sort of shorter messages in contrast are usually for the people that you have kind of in your day-to-day -day life, or at least that you interact with day-to-day -day online. And if you have that kind of shared context, it makes it a lot easier to just kind of throw out a joke, throw out a little image. And it's much more akin to kind of hanging out with a group, big group of friends all the time. Um, it's kind of closer to the staccato flow of conversation that you might walk over to your coworker and say, hey, check out this cool video I saw. Yeah, it's cool. And that's kind of what you're doing every time you're tweeting out something, you know, at that pretty short of an interval. I would argue that in general, kind of the uh, form of communication may be changing, but what we're actually trying to convey is largely the same. We're kind of, you know, trying to keep our friendships, we're uh, adding a dose of humor in our lives, we're sharing the cool things that we're doing, the tasty dishes that we cook, the long walks that we take. You know, it's all of these experiences that we want to share with the people in our lives, and technology is just a way for us to be you know, sharing that faster and more easier. And I think there's also um, an important thing with bandwidth, you know, that that's been increasing. You know, back in the 90s, I would have loved to have reaction GIFs to send everywhere, but it would have taken someone 10 minutes to download it. So we didn't. <laughs> and now that it's, you know, much more accessible and, you know, we can send around more data, I think it's allowing us to have richer communications with the people that we have in our lives. So I would suggest to all of you that we think of these social networks as kind of third places. Um, and this term is borrowed from an urban designer named Ray Oldenburg, who uh, did a lot of work in kind of how we move through the city. And he called first places uh, sort of your home or your family life, very private and secluded. Uh, second places would be sort of school or work or other civic engagement, uh, very public facing. And then third places were kind of the spaces in between. So it might be a coffee shop, a community center, a park, a marketplace, sort of these places where you can go and both hang out with your friends and also interact with strangers, that you're not bounded by sort of these ideas of who you are kind of in the, you know, in the home or in the workplace that you don't have those weights on you, that you are free of constraint and able to kind of interact with people how you want to in that moment. Um, and the important thing about these third places is that at some point, 
uh, the designers and the creators of them have to let it go. And it has to be up to the people um, to kind of decide how they want to use that space and how it can benefit them. Um, and I would argue that the most successful kind of social networks and third places online are going to be those that respond to their users' needs and kind of evolve with them. Uh, this is the first at reply and the first retweet on Twitter, both of which kind of happened organically from the users uh, that were using them. And thankfully, uh, you know, Twitter kind of listened to this and built in these as a core feature um, in the product today. And now these are kind of indistinguishable as, you know, if someone asked you what is Twitter, these would be some of the first things that you would talk about. Um, in contrast, if you have kind of the space that is sort of used for community and you kind of pull back and make it more difficult for people to use, uh, you get something closer to kind of the Flickr redesign, which I love that site, so it kind of pains me to even say this, but yeah, shout out to Lachlan. Um, and these kind of decisions uh, remind me of this piece by Richard Serra, who um, is a very famous sculptor. He does these giant kind of steel walls that often curve in on themselves and create spaces. Um, and this is a piece from the 1980s. It's in the Federal Plaza in New York City, um, and it's called Tilted Arc. And basically what he did is there was this plaza, um, and he erected this giant tilted arc across the whole thing. And in effect, he bisected the space, and where there used to be a way for people to walk around it and sort of walk through the plaza and kind of enjoy it as this social space on their way to and from work, they now had to walk around it, and it was you know, adding minutes into their day, but it was also kind of this ugly thing that they were confronted with when they really just wanted to kind of move through a space freely. Um, and the interesting thing about this piece is that it kind of ignited this huge debate about what is the role of public art. Um, and this turned into a four-year fight for people to get this removed. Um, and there were all these town hall meetings of people saying like, oh, well, I, you know, I used to like walking through there, and now there's this giant wall, and it's gonna invite graffiti, and you know, all these things. But it was really that people hated how it created uh, this block in their space. And Richard Serra kind of released this statement about the piece, um, saying that you know, art isn't supposed to be pleasing, it's not democratic, it's not for the people. Um, He's one of my favorite artists, by the way, and in general, I would agree with this. If it was kind of in a gallery space, um, if it was in its own place, but since he kind of came into this public space and kind of destroyed one of the uh, primary ways that people used it, uh, you know, people hated it, and people rebelled, and people uh, worked to get rid of it. And then, so if we think of that as kind of, you know, what we shouldn't be doing, building these places, I would say that a better model would be something like a park. And you know, a park is very open-ended and it allows for many different uses. You, know, you can walk your dog there, you can sunbathe, you can play frisbee. Um, and I think that parks are so open-ended and so um, available to people that it's easy to forget that someone designed all of this, that someone made a very conscious decision of where in the city to place it, how to landscape it, and you know, how to invite people into the space. It just becomes unconscious. And so I'm talking to you about this today because we are the architects of these online spaces. And it's the decisions that we make that influence you know, the kind of identity that you're able to have online, the kind of relationships that you're able to form, uh, sort of what is required and what is allowed have very real uh, in um, very real sort of influencing how people are able to use that space and what kind of uh, interactions they're able to have on it. And I think that we need to be building the world that we want to be living in. Thank you. Thank you.